There's been two recent studies, one from Michigan State, the other one from the University of Guelph, where they fed um, the omega-3s EPA, DHA, 30 days pre and 35 days post-calving, and they looked at the impact on uterine health. The Michigan State study was unique because they measured the diameter of the pregnant and non-pregnant horn and measured how long it would take for it to shrink down to its normal original state. And even in in both cases, the non-pregnant and pregnant horn compared to the non-supplemented control was at eight weeks was smaller. So it had a significant impact on reducing the size of that uterine horn, particularly the pregnant horn. Hello, everyone. This is Luis Ferreiro with the Dairy Nutrition Black Belt Podcast. And today we'll be discussing everything about management and nutrition interventions to improve uterine involutions. And to shed some light into this very nice topic, uh, we have Doug Waterman, which is Eastern Technical Sales Director with Virtus Nutrition, and we'll be discussing everything about how can we improve this process and make sure that the cows are healthy for the next lactation. So, Doug, thank you so much for joining us today. But before we we dive deep into this topic, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I graduated from the University of Kentucky. I've been in the dairy industry for over 30 years in various roles. Most of my time in the industry has been around nutrition and training and support of nutritionists in the field. So tell us a little bit more about uterine involutions. What is the normal uh, time length for that or some of the factors that may affect that? Uh, Normally it's 20 to 50 days um, if everything goes well. Um, You know, I think you think about the cow herself, what an amazing creature she is. You know, she, she calves and within 650, 60 days, she's making peak milk, making lots of milk, fat, and protein, converting feedstuffs that we can't eat to this milk. And at the same time, we're asking her to go through the involution process and um, get bred back. So hopefully, depending on voluntary weight period, she's being exposed between 60 and 90 days, roughly. But you think about the whole process, the normal shape style of a non-pregnant uterus is maybe around the size of a softball volleyball. And then as the calf grows, um, you're going to be to handle to contain a 80, 90, 100 pound plus calf plus the placenta and all the uterine fluids. Think of how much more space or growth that uterus has to have, that uterine horn. And then within... 60 days shrink back down to its normal size, uh, shape and size, and have epithelial remodeling. Uh, I think that's a big thing is getting that epithelial lining back to its original state, histological state. And I think more that we know about it, you know, over-conditioned cows, difficult calving, probably are two of the most detrimental, if you will, to uterine involution, in my opinion, Um, anything related to stress. I think too many moves, overcrowding, not enough bunk space, particularly pre-fresh, I think contribute to this. Um, There's some work that Dr. Berrigan out of Penn State's been talking about as he looks at the metabolic disorders post-calving. He's wondering if the length of the inflammation period at dry off may be tied into that. So cows that experience significant inflammation for for um, a certain period of time post-calving may have some influence on the metabolic diseases and therefore would influence, potentially could influence the rate at which uterine involution occurs. It doesn't have to be this hard to keep cows pregnant. At Virtus Nutrition, we understand the negative impact that lost pregnancies have on a dairy's economics. Every failed pregnancy means more money spent on expensive semen, additional replacements to raise, and fewer valuable beef calves to sell. Feed what embryos need. Strata with EPA DHA, the pregnancy nutrient. So basically, if I understood correctly, 
everything that we know about how to mitigate issues with metabolic disorders for transition cows will have an important impact. Said that, can you guide us a little bit uh, through some of the key steps uh, for uh, the involutions as well as some key strategies that can help us to make sure that the cow can actually go through this process well and be ready, not only for the next lactation, but also to, uh, to the next repro cycle that she's going to have to go through. From my understanding, it, it, the in, involution occurs rapidly in the first 10 to 14 days. Big decrease in the uterine size, getting rid of the fluids, placenta. Then it kind of slows down. Um, heifers occurs much faster than mature cows, so the more calves they had, it may take a little bit longer. If they have had a difficult calving or retained placenta, that's going to extend that period of time. You know, if they have a metritis or pyometria, that's even going to take a lot longer for that uterus to come back. Maybe it'll shrink down to the right size, but it hasn't gone through the remodeling of the epithelial lining that you'd like it to have. So it's conducive, the environment, uterine environment's conducive to um, rebreeding. I'm a firm believer that anything we can do to maintain dry matter intake is key. So like I said, not overcrowding the pre-fresh group minimizes the changing, you know, giving them plenty of bunk space. Don't get your cows over conditioned, you know, have the right decad diet in place. Um, all those things to me set the stage for the cow to be successful at calving. And then that sets the stage for how quickly uterine involution will occur. And you, you mentioned a little bit about the degree of inflammation and how, how the cow is exposed uh, to inflammation could also have a major impact. Could you please elaborate on that and tell us a little bit more, especially related to dry off as well as calving? I think we take for granted maybe that even healthy cows go through a period of inflammation. So every stress this cow is exposed to she will have an inflammatory response. And two of the most uh, biggest stressors in that cow's life outside of maybe environmental mastitis would be dry off and calving. And Dr. Berrigan showed that cows that dried off over 15 kilos of milk, which is pretty much every cow that we milk today, um, could have an inflammatory period that would last up to 34 days. So the longer and more excessive and more chronic that inflammation is, it may actually predispose, if you will, the cow to more metabolic disorders post-calving. Um, Lance Baumgard's theory is talking about that maybe some of the metabolic, we always thought metabolic disease caused the inflammatory response, but maybe in some cases it's actually reversed and inflammation causes the, um, the metabolic disease itself. So I think anything we can do to reduce the amount of stress, prevent very high inflammation, or more importantly, chronic inflammation, the cow is going to withstand that uh, inflammation better, that stress better. Are you aware of any new approaches that uh, maybe are being studied that can help us uh, further with all this uh, potential issue? There's been two recent studies, one from Michigan State, the other one from the University of Guelph, where they fed um, the omega-3s EPA, DHA, 30 days pre and 35 days post-calving, and they looked at the impact on uterine health. The Michigan State study was unique because they measured the diameter of the pregnant and non-pregnant horn and measured how long it would take for it to shrink down to its normal original state. And even in, in both cases, the non-pregnant pregnant horn compared to the non-supplemented control was at eight weeks was smaller. So it had a significant impact on reducing the size of that uterine horn, particularly the pregnant horn. Um, in the University of Guelph scenario, they looked at uterine remodeling. Re-epithization of the uterine lining was enhanced when feeding omega-3, EPA, and DHA. Uh, they showed an improvement in uh, the concentration of uterine fluid, an increase in progesterone, a trend towards improvement and reducing some of the inflammatory responses. But the big thing was 
more cows were pregnant at 35 days. The cows that were supplemented with EPA, DHA to 35 days post-calving had a higher percent pregnancy rate. Oh, very interesting. So uh, basically, we have to make sure that we are feeding pre and postpartum, right? Because a lot of times when we discuss about those different strategies, people always try to focus postpartum, but probably there is a huge impact early on based on all that inflammation that you discuss uh, due to the dry off, correct? I would agree. And you want to have enough EPA, DHA in the system at calving to help control some of that, to resolve that inflammation as quickly as possible. Absolutely. So, Doug, thank you again for joining us today. I do think that this was a very interesting discussion, a lot for people to digest, think about. And as usual, right, good management uh, and make sure the cows are with very low stress is key to make sure that the next lactation uh, will go well and their producers will certainly benefit from that. Thank you at home for joining us today and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.